I, I think if, if we're trying to yeah. make the explanation succinct, we should put the ideas together. The ideas are stuff that we've been working on for over 50 years. Parents of toddlers have to be patient. When feelings are too big, when feelings are getting out of control, we have to, everybody has to find a way to regulate them and modulate them. And toddlers are just learning to do that. They're at the beginning of a long process. And so the idea is to take those big feelings that they're experiencing in their whole selves and bring them down to just the right size so that we can look at it and figure out what it's a signal of and solve the problem, whatever it is. A lot of parents faced with great big feelings have been advised, put your kid in a timeout till he settles down and calms down as if the kid is supposed to be able to do that on his own. They shouldn't be alone then because I'm going to sit with you now and I'm going to try and help you make that feeling just the right size so you could hold it in one hand and then you could talk about it. Now do you want me to, you want to hold my finger and squeeze my finger, see if you can squeeze that. So pretty soon, it's interesting, these kids would be sitting and you'd walk into a room of two-year-olds and they'd be <laughs> By the time they're one and a half, they're two, they can be doing that. And they do it throughout. With toddlers, one of the things that parents worry about the most, two and three-year-olds, is whether their children share nicely. Right. I want the truck. No, I want the truck. We realize that sharing is the wrong concept. We shouldn't be trying to get children to share. You can't cut a truck in half. Right. That's not sharing. What children need to learn to do is take turns. And this is where a developmental viewpoint comes in because babies of six months, their favorite game is handing something to a grown-up and then the grown-up hands it back. And then they hand it to the grown-up and the grown-up hands it back. Right. That's the basis of turn-taking. and it becomes the basis of being able to have a conversation because conversation is about turn-taking. We began to think about this in terms of a full turn, that children needed to feel confident that they would be protected in having their full turn so that they could complete a play sequence. And it was very important because when the children became much more secure in the idea that the grown-up would protect their full turn, they realized the grown-up will protect the other person's full turn, and there were many fewer disputes. And in fact, kids would finish their own play sequence and then take the truck over to Johnny, who'd been waiting. But to do that, you also have to be able to wait. So waiting muscles, frustration tolerance in psychological parlance, and turn-taking are reciprocal skills. One of the things we devised in the preschool is the idea of the three buckets. And the three buckets turns out to be a really seminal idea for us. The three buckets are what are children in charge of, what are parents and teachers in charge of, and what is no one in charge of? So we actually made it into a game that parents and children could play together. They could put three receptacles and then they could write something or even just make a ball of paper and name it and throw it into the right bucket. It said, bedtime. And then they threw that into the parents' bucket. And they said, bedtime is something parents decide. But sleep time is something children decide because that's about your own body and you own your own body. And so they played this game about all kinds of daily life things and began to differentiate and it became a sort of shorthand. What can Nora do when well, she could now pee in the potty? And everyone said, yeah. So she put that in her bucket. In her bucket. She was very happy. Not parents aren't in charge of that. Rain, I want to be in charge of the rain. 
And then the little girls could say, no, no, daddy, you're not in charge of the rain. That goes in the third bucket. Nobody's in charge of the rain. There are things we want to be in charge of that we can't be in charge of. Right. But it really then became a way that parents could say, that's in my bucket. I know you really want to do that, but that's in my bucket. I'm the person who decides that. But this is in your bucket. And it really eased the the tension and the friction around the bossiness. The other thing it does is foster competence because it allows the child to gain confidence and skills that they can try something and succeed and have the people around them be really happy to see that. A kid takes chalk and draws all over the patio furniture. Now, do you not let the kid watch their iPad three hours later before bedtime? Right. That would be a punishment. Discipline, on the other hand, is about teaching and learning. That's where the word comes from. You forgot that we only use chalk on the sidewalk or the blackboard. What are we going to do to make it easier to remember next time? Well, I guess we're going to not be able to go to the park now because we have to get some soap and water and scrubbing brushes and scrub down the patio furniture together. True discipline really has to do with how you teach a child to make a judgment more and more in anticipation. By that time, we're talking about five and six-year-olds. Being able to anticipate well, if I do this, what might happen? The grown-up has to look at what the actual consequence is and turn that into a learning opportunity, which then becomes something the child can internalize. Now, when you do something, you have to think about the goods and the bad. If you knock down someone else's building blocks and he's very upset, but you knock down this huge structure, so what are the goods about it? There are some goods. Well, you feel good. You feel, wow, I knocked down this whole structure. What else is good about that? Uh, uh, can't think of much. Let's think of some of the bad. Uh, well, he'll be angry at me. Yeah. He'll tell the teacher, and the teacher won't like it. Yeah, and we don't make any like moral judgments. We say, oh, so there, if you knock down his structure, there are four bads and one good. So your inside helper should tell you, hey, listen, now it will feel good, but you know what? You can build your own structure and knock it down, and then there'll be no bads. Like, you don't cross on a red light, you cross on a green light. And if you forget, your inside helper should remind you. We really want a child's conscience to not only be a prohibitor, but we also want a child's conscience to be a facilitator. So we want the inside helper to stop you when you're going to do something wrong, but also to encourage you and approve of you when you're going to do something good or right or creative. I think the way that parents can deal with the inevitable questions about death is to point out that it's something that people aren't in charge of. It belongs in the third bucket. But most people live their whole lives. They live a full life. And that means that they have to be five, and then they have to be six, and then they have to go to elementary school and they have to, you tell the story of all the things people live through and you make it very long and quite boring, right. which really brings right. the anxiety down right. and reminds the kid that it's not tomorrow that they have to be worried about it. Right. So if we're looking at a little baby, had a sippy cup in one hand and a spoon in the other hand. And she was trying to get the sippy cup to her mouth. And every time she tried to grab the second handle, the spoon got in her way. 
and she, she kept at it and she was working at it. And her dad was watching her and her dad was like, oh, clearly wanting to help, but he held off because she wasn't distressed. She was just working very hard. And finally she managed to grab the second handle with the hand that had the spoon in it and got the thing to her mouth and beamed. Now we would say that those parents were learning to gauge what is a good stretch for a child and not a stress for a child. The child learned to keep working at something, to persist, and got the reward of the pleasure, which is self-reinforcing and motivates the next time an effort is needed. That's a baby. But think about the importance of that emotional muscle throughout life. If you don't know how to persist, if you don't know how to work at something, if you don't think you're gonna get a reward in the pleasure in mastery, why learn anything? Why try anything? So competence in a, can be discerned in a little baby and fostered in a little baby. All right, well, thank you all.